um, I'll just be talking about uh, Kilt University and uh, what uh, I've seen uh, over the years uh, with uh, science communication and uh, institutional communication for, uh, for Japanese. I mentioned about uh, Nakamitsu-san because uh, he's really getting at the core of, of why we're doing this, which is, which is grabbing people's interest and, and keeping them. And the, the key word for that is storytelling. And so this is something uh, you hear about storytelling all the time when, uh, when people in other countries, when communicators in other countries meet too, um, is telling a story. And so that's, that's probably the most important thing for writers uh, and for producers of communication is, is finding some way of bringing the reader, bringing the uh, viewer through your material with the story and, and having a line that's connecting them. And that's, that's what Nakamisan was talking about too, uh, in terms of, you know, oh, you just turned it on just to see what it was like, but then you ended up watching it to the end. That, that's the story that's pulling you through. It's this, it's this continuous line. Um, and that's also the trick that the TV people are using uh, when, they when they create these programs about all sorts of topics that you thought you'd never, you know, would be interested at all. And yet somehow you sit there and you watch it all the way to the end. So um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an art because the, um, it, it isn't something that all of us have really. Um, it's a talent. Uh, and it's separate from the science. So when scientists do something, they're curious about something and they're pursuing it. And so they have their own kind of internal way of wanting to reach something or wanting to go beyond what they have now. Um, and it isn't necessarily a story, but it, there could be a story in there. And so it's important when the scientist has something like that and has this sort of motivational vector of something that's pulling them through the research. It's important for a communicator that's us, it's important for us to look at that and to say, okay, so the scientist is following this path. Is that a path that we can put the readers and the viewers on and they will follow it too? Is that going to work? So. So it, it, it's that process dynamic of finding something that will, will be a continuous flow and will bring people through the topic. Maybe it doesn't work. You know, maybe the science doesn't have a story to it. That, that happens too. You know, it's, it, it's, we, we see a lot of interesting papers where there's just a result. The process itself was a result of, of, of lots of small things and it, it doesn't really amount to a story. Um, so it's maybe just a one, one time, we found this, this is good, this is interesting, this is useful. Um, but uh, it's, it's where, where you can fit that into something else. So maybe, maybe the story is outside of the science. Maybe there's, uh, of course, a common thing to do with popular science is to profile the researcher and to find a story about something that happened to the researcher in the course of doing the science. So, um, so it's this looking for the storyline somewhere kind of idea, uh, which, is, which is so prevalent um, and, and really so necessary in, in uh, pulling people through. And that, that's <laughs> what, what uh, Nakamitsa and his colleagues are doing at NIMS is just so much fun because the, the whole idea of pulling cooking um, into, into a material science uh, is great uh, because maybe, you know, the material science itself doesn't have the story, but the cooking has the story. So uh, that's what I mean about, about sometimes going outside of the science and finding the thread. It's, it's just really great. And, and as he also says, uh, even through this virtual medium of a video conference, um, exciting different senses uh, through cooking is, uh, you know, sort of imagining the smell of the melting cheese and butter and whatever uh, is, uh, is really, is really great. So that's, that's a, that's a definite bravo for, uh, for NIMS and, uh, and everybody. That's great. Um, okay, so storytelling, that's one important thing. 
Um, the uh, the next area uh, that uh, that I want to mention about is the difference be between writers and editors. And this is a little bit of a of a difficult distinction um, if uh, if you're not used to it, because in in our usual experience in Japan, when we're dealing with English, we often think of the person producing the English or the company producing the English as being one thing, one entity. So if you have a colleague, a staff person who writes English in your institution, that person does the whole thing. Or you send it to a vendor and the vendor does the whole thing and it comes back and it's, it's done. But it's important to realize that really good communication and really good English takes more than one set of eyes. It takes more than one person. So in terms of building a communication strategy, it's key to understand that hiring just one person is not enough. It's really not sufficient to just have one writer because English is very complicated and there are many Englishes and it's not just, of course, it's not just an English issue. This exists in any language, but if you have just one person, you have just that person's opinion, that person's view. And it isn't just about American and British English or English in India or English in Singapore. Um, it's about a view of the culture of English practice and English usage, um, which is much more complicated than that. So that's why it typically comes to a breakdown between writers and editors. And the way that this has evolved in media, in media companies in the West, um, is that sadly, uh, more than a decade ago now, um, probably uh, getting close to almost two decades ago, uh, because of restructuring, because of the internet, um, because of changing uh, the media business practices, most of the science writers were laid off. Uh, they, they no longer were employed by the media companies themselves. Um, the editors are still working for the media companies. So um, it's, it's a landscape which has completely changed. You have freelancers, people who are writing, uh, they just do writing and they write for lots of different publications or different media. Um, and then the editors are at the media company. We, in our case, what's important about having different levels uh, of work is we need writers who understand about the topics and who understand can deal directly with the researchers and really talk about how to best present the science and the research. That sort of ground level interaction is really key to really understand and to convey the story uh, necessarily. But then above that, there has to be an editor who is looking at a broader issue, looking at what sort of research has been, has been sent out already and how that is defining the institution. What sort of image impression is that giving to the rest of the world? And it's, it's that sort of wider perspective which is often missing uh, when I see uh, English being produced by institutions. And it's also the perspective that is very much missing from vendors. Because this is a terrible uh, problem that I've noticed with, uh, with vendors is that they are writing to, their, their audience is a staff person in the institution who's going to check their work. So it, it's just a purely a, a contractual uh, sort of relationship. It's not long-term necessarily. I mean, sometimes people have, sometimes these institutions have long-term contracts with certain vendors, but the job is on a sort of a one-to-one -one basis. The, uh, the person actually doing the writing has 
in, may, in most cases, very little understanding about the needs of the institution or doesn't have any understanding about how the institution wants to portray itself to the rest of the world. So essentially a huge communication opportunity is being missed by simply saying, here's something in Japanese, sending it to the vendor and saying, turn this into English. If that's it, what you'll get back is something which will pass through the check process. In other words, the words will be translated, but some kind of overall meaning, some kind of overall impression of the institution will be lost. If there's something that the institution wants to convey about, wants the readers to understand about why the institution is doing what it's doing or how this connects to other things that the institution is doing, none of that is going to come through. The, the way in which uh, English is written uh, has, says a lot about the institution. And, and uh, this goes to the level where um, if you look at major universities in the West, um, they have produced individual style guides. And a style guide is in a very basic sense, just about spelling and punctuation which is to say, in, in the very easiest way to, uh, to understand this is to say, are we gonna be used American spelling or British spelling or American punctuation or British punctuation? Or are we going to just take a style guide that exists out there and just use it? So um, that's a kind of a decision which actually needs to be made at an institutional level. And there has to be a reason for it because choosing a certain style means our institution is associating ourselves with a certain image. And so that's why it's not, uh, it isn't a decision that can be just made lightly. It's true that American English tends to be prevalent in Japan in the usage of, of English. Um, but why is that? It's not, is it just because of GHQ? I mean, <laughs> can we, are we going to say something like that? Um, if you think about it, though, uh, it, it's a way of saying we are associating ourselves with this kind of intellectual community or these kinds of institutions are our peers. It's, it has a lot to do with how the institution wants to portray itself. So that kind of decision making has to take place at an editorial level. It's not a writer who's going to make those sorts of decisions. The writer is talking to the scientist. The writer is trying to figure out what the paper is saying or what the research is about. It's, it's a very different level of, of thinking. You need to have someone at a higher level who has a broader view and who is saying, this is how the institution wishes to portray themselves. Just to give an example, um, a, a practical example, um, one of the first things uh, at when I was uh, previously working for the URA office at the University of Perkura, um, a colleague and I uh, decided that one of the first things we needed was a style guide, an, an original style guide for the university. So we came up with a document which is called the Kura Style Guide. And Unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to update it and it, it needs to be updated. So it, it's, a bit, it's getting a bit out of date, but we decided on something a little bit radical, which is we wanted to make text, uh, the main purpose is to make the text as easy as possible to read. Um, and uh, we also had digital devices in mind so that people reading on smartphones or on computer screens would be able to read a clean, uh, easily, sort of visually easy to uh, understand style of writing English. And um, one of the, the, the reason why I say it's radical is that because American uh, English usage is so prevalent in Japan, we decided to use American spelling. But in order to make it visually more clean, we decided to use British punctuation. And you may wonder, 
what is this? This sounds sort of confusing or something. But we felt that this is an important message. And looking at style guides from Oxford and Yale and you know, other sort of big universities in the West, um, we, we could see that they were doing something like this too, which is, which is to say, it isn't just what you're saying, but it's how you're saying it that shows what your institution is trying to do or what kind of institution you are. So the, the thing about the British and uh, European use of English, which is different from American, um, is that there are, uh, the punctuation is very simple. And uh, there are very few periods. And, and this is a, a quite a big difference um, visually because, uh, for example, in, in American usage, uh, PhD or doctor always has a period, always has the abbreviation period. So doctor period, PhD uh, would be a properly written PH period, D period. and um, our feeling at the time uh, was that if you have a document that you're looking at on the screen and you're, you're, when you're looking at things on the screen, you tend to kind of go through them rather quickly you tend to kind of scroll through. Um, and visually you need to know where the sentence begins and where the sentence ends. And it's very important to have a, a whole sense of where the idea is visually that you're reading about. So on the screen, periods often tend to be very small. Uh, and yet, there, if there's a lot of them, it becomes mentally confusing. Is this the end of the sentence? I'm sure you, you know what I mean. If you see a sentence that has lots of abbreviations in it and lots of periods in it, sometimes it's hard to know where the sentence actually ends. And we wanted to avoid all of that confusion. And we looked at British punctuation where there's no periods, none at all. All abbreviations are without periods entirely. So you look, you look through, the only period that appears is at the end of the sentence. It seems like a kind of a, of a minor point. I mean, okay, you know, this is, this is me a little bit of a, you know, uh, punctuation typography junkie that I am. But um, with the idea of creating something that is visually clean and visually easy to understand, we wanted to convey that our ideas are also easy to understand. And it's, it seems, it may seem like something that's fairly minor, but that was a conscious decision on our part. If you look through the English pages on our, on our university's website, you'll see this. You'll see that uh, the style guide is, has been applied. And um, I think it makes a difference. There's, there's some other uh, differences too that are important, but, but that's one of the major ones. Okay, so got into the style guides, but that's a little bit about why writing and editing is different. And a little bit about why there are different roles like this that are, that are important. So um, I mentioned about storytelling and, and uh, how that ties into what uh, Nakamitsu was talking about and about writing and editing. And for the third major point I'd like to, to mention today um, is reputation management. Reputation management is something that um, occasionally uh, is heard here. Um, and uh, you might, it might sound a little bit like a, a, a buzzword, but it's something that I see constantly uh, in the communication that we're doing for the university. And the important point that I find about it is that sometimes almost more than half of the time, it seems, the kind of reputation management that we're doing is not about good news, but it's about dealing with crises and dealing with bad news. So it covers, reputation management covers the whole spectrum really of communication. Often in, 
in the science uh, research and news area, science communication area, we're talking about happy news. We don't have apology press conferences. We don't have to worry about something bad happening, generally speaking. Um, that, in, in our case too, in the case of Kilby University, that's handled separately. Uh, a separate team is doing the news that is not so good for the university. So how is it that we can contribute to that or we can be part of that if necessary? And it has to do with understanding what is reputation. Often another idea that's used in conjunction with, with reputation is branding. Um, but branding can be, can be much harder to define uh, unless, unless it's something which the institution has already done a, a thorough kind of uh, thought process on or the leadership of the institution has a strong idea about or something like that. But the, the reputation of the institution is something which the science news that we're putting out, the research developments that we're talking about feeds directly into that. It feeds directly into reputation. And we want reputation to, we want to build reputation for our institutions because that leads into the things which we as an institution, we're trying to aim for things like having a strong reputation, meaning people at other institutions in other countries will want to work with us, will want to join in our projects, will want to write papers together with us. Um, these, these kinds of issues which uh, we will, we are hoping will lead to all sorts of other uh, factors. And there's a, there's a temptation here to try to measure these sorts of things, but it's also, it's, it's very difficult. And I, I feel it's very dangerous to actually say, to try to measure these sorts of things. You come down to, to really slippery topics like uh, university rankings and so on, which, which we all know uh, can be useful in some ways, but are also uh, very dangerous in other ways. Okay, so managing reputation. Um, I, have, I have a number of, of examples of this um, from, uh, from the last couple of years, and especially during the uh, time of the coronavirus, uh, we had a very uh, a difficult example last spring where um, uh, our uh, most recent Nobel laureate, uh, Tasco Honjo, his name was used in a rumor that was being spread through social media. I initially, it seemed like he was starting in India. And since it, it was both in Hindi as well as in English, but since it was initially also in English, it immediately spread. And over the course of days, we saw this moving. We saw this story moving from social media into uh, the general news, since uh, the, the general news media is, is following trends in, uh, in social media very closely uh, everywhere. And we started to see stories which were repeating this false information that were in, uh, that was being reported on social media. So this is very disturbing to me. It's not only disturbing because it's very false, but it says something extremely bad about our, one of our Nobel laureates. And I really felt strongly that this is the sort of thing that even the Nobel Foundation is looking at. Like how does an institution work with an issue like this? I feel it really shows how the reputation of the institution can either be seen as, oh, that's not us, you know, it's just a rumor, we're not gonna talk about it, or we don't know what to say or whatever, or are we going to be proactive about it? 
are we going to come out and say, no, that's false. We are about this and to say something positive. There's a common uh, feeling in, uh, in the media, um, especially in uh, political news about trying to stay within the same news cycle. Um, and the news cycle, there's a lot of debate. It used to be 24 hours uh, when, uh, when cable news started you know, decades ago. Um, but with the internet, the news cycle is getting faster all the time. Sometimes it seems it's only maybe, maybe 15 minutes or something like that. But it's important to, if a, even if there's a bad story out, in this case, something, uh, a bad rumor, it's important to have the university's position, what the university is trying to say, to be out there as quickly as possible. Not, not a week later, not even the next day, but if possible, the same day, immediately. And fortunately, I have a working relationship with uh, Dr. Honjo. So I was able to reach out to him immediately, uh, get his okay to put a personal statement on the website. And at the same time, I talked to the leadership and I got there okay. I said, I'm gonna have Dr. Honjo make a statement, a written statement, we're gonna put that on the website. Is that okay? And they said, yes, they, they understood the situation. So getting those, those two things together uh, within the same day, as we found out about this news, we were able to put a statement up on the website. And then from the following day, pretty much all of the news articles that we saw, even if they reported about the rumor, they also said the university has this statement from Honjo on the website. So from the reader's perspective, it's not just hearing one side. It's not just hearing the rumor. It's also understanding that the university doesn't agree, Honjo doesn't agree, and the truth is here. Whether you choose to believe one or the other is up to the reader, but at least we're out there, at least we're part of the story. So that's the key thing about being quick and about being in the same news cycle. It's, it's, not, um, it's not easy. It, it doesn't happen always that, uh, that we can turn something around that quickly. Um, we're all in institutions where a lot of different people have opinions and different people expect to be consulted about important decisions. So this was something where um, it was very difficult uh, initially to, to have uh, the, it, it seemed uh, almost impossible actually to get this happening that quickly, but we were able to do it. Um, English the first day, uh, the second day, our, uh, our uh, very talented colleague uh, who's now at, at Ashby, uh, Shimizu-san, um, he helped with the Japanese version and we also got uh, uh, Honjo to, uh, to sign off on that. So um, we were able to put this out there. It wasn't a big Japanese new media story, but that's okay. Uh, we wanted to say, to be on record as saying, this is our stand. This is how we believe. Um, and so it was actually very difficult. It still took me another couple of weeks after that to kind of clean up a lot of things. But it wasn't, it, it was starting from a fairly strong point, luckily, um, that, that even though we, we weren't sure where the story was coming from or who was separating it. My greatest fear right from the start and you have to imagine this is back april may of last year at that point the united states president was making press conferences every day about the pandemic he was going into the press room and he was actually saying things every day and the content of the rumor was such that it would have been perfect for him to repeat it if he had gotten up in a daily press conference at the white house and he had said, look, this Nobel laureate in Japan is saying this. That would have been terrible for our reputation, needless to say. So that was the greatest fear that I had and the greatest reason, the greatest motivation I had for wanting to move quickly on this. 
is that we needed to be there before something like that happened. And fortunately, we were super lucky about that. He didn't say anything about us. He didn't say anything about Dr. Honjo. So it's, it, it was kind of like, oh. <laughs> um, I feel like we sometimes do more for the reputation of the university, even when something doesn't happen, if we're able to be prepared about it. And that, that's, just, that's just one example. But it's the kind of thing that if we didn't do anything, if we just sort of sat back and took our time about making decisions or just decided to ignore it because it's not something we can really address easily, that could create down the line enormous problems that, that we would probably wouldn't have any way of properly dealing with. So um, that's the management part of it. Sometimes it's not positive, sometimes it's not a good thing, but somehow being in control, somehow having your hand on what it is that's going to happen next. That's, uh, that's a big part of it. So, okay, so where is, how does this um, fit into uh, building communication strategies? I mentioned about writing and editing and the storytelling is something that sort of everybody has to understand. Um, and uh, that's another great thing to see about uh, Nakamisa and his colleagues and uh, Kobayasan at uh, NIMS is that their team, you can tell, you know, they, they really understand this. Um, uh, and uh, and that's, that's a really key thing to have, have all of the players on the team understanding the same, the same idea. Um, over the weekend, I received uh, a question just uh, coincidentally uh, from another former uh, WPI colleague. Um, and he was asking me, he said, he said one of his senior colleagues in his uh, communications operation um, doesn't feel it's really that necessary to have writing, English writing in house. And, um, and the, the question was, uh, this senior colleague is saying, why don't we, why don't we just, just send it all out to vendors? And I, uh, I, or, I addressed this already, of course, uh, the difference between writing and editing and the difference um, in terms of building reputation by uh, creating some, uh, some kind of institutional idea, some kind of brand image for the institution. Um, but I think anybody in this business would agree, the longer we do it, the more of a sense we have of what the institution is about, what the university, what the research organization, what its strengths are, what areas need to be improved or expanded, and how best to tie these different elements together and create a image of the institution that we can send out to the rest of the world. And this applies not just to individual institutions, but it applies to all of us as a, as a whole. How is it that Japan can present itself as a technologically and scientifically strong nation? How is it that we can play to our strengths and portray these to the world? So, in, in many cases, we get asked, you know, um, what sort of science uh, is, uh, is going to do well, or, or how do you choose which, which releases to translate into English or, or so on. And it ties into these, these issues about reputation and about what the strengths are, what the real strengths are, and then also what the perceived strengths are. 
So if you look overseas, there are, there's a lot of impressions about Japan and expectations. And occasionally these things don't match. So probably the, the most difficult example of this was after the Fukushima disaster, after the earthquake and tsunami, but then especially about the nuclear reactor, the nuclear power plant in Fukushima. Because the impression of Japan is high technology, uh, advanced science, and there's an assumption that there's a technological solution that Japan is able to produce. So when the reactor accident took place, one of the first things to, uh, to come out of this was an impression that why aren't there robots in there? Where Japan is, is so advanced, why aren't there all kinds of machines moving into there to find out what's going on and to clean it up. Why can't this happen? And you have to think in, in completely different ways about this. For us inside of Japanese research institutions, we can see why that didn't happen. We can see why Tokyo Electric Power doesn't have a robotics office that is doing these sorts of things. Um, we can understand that it was a US military robot that was the first one that went in there. So um, it, it, it's these institutional kind of walls or institutional roadblocks, you could say, um, that, that maybe are part of the problem. Um, it isn't that Japan doesn't have that sort of technology. It's that it's maybe not in the right place at the right time. Um, and yet looked at from outside of Japan, where you can't see those walls and you can't see those roadblocks. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem to make sense. So um, that's where, it, it's an uncomfortable example, but that's where playing to an expectation about reputation uh, can be a really um, important thing. Um, and uh, understanding about what it is that uh, that is, our perceived strength, what is it, what it is that uh, we're expected to be, to be strong about. Um, okay, I'll, I'll kind of leave my uh, extemporaneous comments here uh, because there are a number of questions already. Um, just, to, just to reiterate, storytelling, writing and editing, and reputation management. Those are the, if you can remember those three things, I think uh, that will help in forming an idea about what sort of communication strategy you want to have. And after that, what kind of people you need to help communicate. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now and uh, talk to you during the questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm.